This is the Stop Time Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Hopkins, and I'm here to engage you in thought-provoking motivational conversations around practicing the art of living in the moment. I'm a certified life coach, and I'm excited to dig deep and offer insights into embracing who we are and where we are at. My next guest is a theater, film, and television director who is one of Forbes magazine's 30 Under 30 in Hollywood and Entertainment, class of 2019. She has worked for CBS, ABC, Nickelodeon, Paramount+, Plus, Cirque du Soleil, and TikTok, among others, and also on some of the world's most prestigious venues, including the Kennedy Center, Radio City Music Hall, and Lincoln Center. Recent theater credits include Evita at American Rep Theater, New York City Cent- and New York City Center, um, Rent and Sunset Boulevard, both at the Kennedy Center, and Carmen at Rose Hall Lincoln Center, which was a New York Times critic's pick. Her first documentary feature film, The Show Must Go On, premiered at Broadway's Majestic Theater and was released worldwide on Apple TV. It examined the resilience of the theater industry in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Outside of her work in the theater, film, and television, she currently serves as Chief of Staff for Human First Coalition, which is an organization dedicated to providing humanitarian aid in Afghanistan. She holds a BA from Stanford University and an MA from Harvard University. She makes her Broadway directorial debut helming How to Dance in Ohio, which opens very soon at the Velasco Theater this fall. I am so excited, truly, for this conversation today with Sammy Canold. And welcome, Sammy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Ditto. Really, thanks so much for taking the time. You're a busy gal. My pleasure. So I spent the morning brushing up on all things Sammy, which was a delight, I have to say. And I just want to kind of just stop for a moment and acknowledge and celebrate you, not only for everything you've done thus far in your career and in your life, but actually what really stands out to me and that I'd like to honor you for is your integrity. And your honesty and your commitment to what you do. Thank you. That, that, that means a lot. uh, And it's something that I try to lead with and don't always succeed, but uh, I'm I'm grateful to hear it's reading. It shines through. I feel it in you. And I feel from where I sit and not knowing you and just, yeah, I looked at your credits and I've seen what you've done. Lots of people have done lots of stuff, but what shines through is you and the consistency with which you apply yourself. Where does that come from? Talk to me about that. I think it's, um, I mean, I, I would guess that if there's a there's a place that that reads through, it's from uh, the commonality between the kind of work that I like to do personally. But I do try to seek out projects that are uh, a form of advocacy in and of themselves or are uh, projects that are going to have some concrete impact in terms of whether that's like aid or, or, or sort of providing an opportunity for a certain group of people to be seen by the work, you know, or that's actually like concrete, you know, charitable contribution. I I just think that as artists, we have such large platforms on which to tell stories and be heard. And uh, I take that responsibility very seriously. And I want to try to choose work that I think will serve that mission. Yeah. Where do you think that comes from? Um. Or why is that important to you? I it's mean, a, a yeah. good question. I mean, I think that um, my grandparents were, were very like uh, service oriented as individuals. And I think that it was like instilled in me from a very young age that like I had a very privileged upbringing and it was my responsibility to pay that forward in some way and uh, took that very seriously. But I also think that it's just sort of it's hard to dissect where something like that comes from because I think it's just sort of like the way I think, like, why wouldn't I want to make an impact (laughs) if I could? (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. Um, Sorry. That's a wishy-washy answer, but I, no, no, it's not. 
It's not at all. I've just always sort of felt that way. Yeah, no, that's not wishy-washy at all. It's interesting. It sounds like it was modeled and that it was something that that was modeled well so that you you were easy to, it was easy for you to ascribe to that. It was yeah. natural. It felt natural. I, I would think so. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I've never really thought about that before. Mm-hmm. Um, like, where does that impulse come from? I mean, uh, of late, a whole other part of my life is sort of aside from theater and, and film is, is working in humanitarian aid in Afghanistan. And I think that when you, um, because my, my fiance works in that world. And um, when you have so much exposure to issues that are really life and death, um, it, I think, impacts how you view the work that you do in another industry, which is not to diminish the work that we do, but to say, okay, um, a, there are a lot of people in the world who are working in fields who are who are in circumstances that are really consequential in an existential way and we as artists have the ability to either reflect those stories or to sway hearts and minds to uh cause less suffering in the world um and so uh that is sort of where i i've been thinking a lot in the last two years as i've sort of been exposed to that work more and more Mm. um about how i can uh take that mindset and bring it into theater and uh you know, take that responsibility really seriously. Yeah, 100%. Take me back a little bit to your origin story. If I find it really interesting to know how you arrived where you are here. Yeah, so um, I, I'm very lucky. My uh, mom is a theater producer and film director, and my dad's a film producer. So I grew up uh, surrounded by this world and uh, was very uh, intoxicated by it at a very young age. And it was sort of assumed that I was going to go into it. Um, like it was, you know, the family business, uh, like if you're, you know, born and on to like a farm, it's assumed you're going to take over the farm. That was sort of, you know, my, my, my experience. And, um, I recognize the immense privilege of, um, coming from that background. And I, had a brief, you know, period of revolt in high school where I was like, I'm not going to do what my parents do. But then um, I realized it was just sort of where I was heading anyway. And uh, I went to school originally for education policy. And uh, then about three weeks in, I was doing theater extracurricularly in the evenings. And I realized I was enjoying that way more than the classes I was taking during the day. And so then I switched my major to theater and haven't really looked back uh, since. And I was very lucky that, you know, where I went to school at Stanford, they had a very robust uh, student theater scene. So I was able to Mm -hmm. uh, direct a lot of productions um, in college. uh, And there were a lot of resources. And so, you know, uh, two of these productions were in 1700 seat theaters. And so that kind of experience in an academic setting is is like totally uh, invaluable. And it sort of allowed me to hit the ground running when I when I moved from there into uh, into the professional world. Mm. Did you grow up on the West Coast? No, I grew up uh, in New York, um, oh, okay. and uh, and that you know uh, in the suburbs of of the city. So, um, but because my mom worked in theater, we would you know be in the city and in rehearsal rooms and in um, techs, you know every weekend. And um, so that exposure was really really helpful. But then I went to school out west. I love that you that when I asked you in the beginning, you know why why is making impact important to you or whatever? Well, well, why wouldn't it be like do like it's a one it's a wonderful thing to, to make impact, obviously, right? But it's not even anything that you even questioned. Um, yeah. And then it's also interesting that you know you kind of by rote had your rebel phase, right? But it sounds like it was in you. You didn't have a choice, even if you right. You kind of yeah yeah yeah. But some people would. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, my brother is not in theater. um, And uh, I think everybody sort of finds their own their own path. But um, for me, it was very, you know, my my parents tell this story of like how when I was a toddler, I used to put on shows, put on shows on the bathroom counter with um, the little like shampoo bottles that you get in hotels um and you know i had like a collection of like 50 of them and would do you know like little you know musicals where i would sing and like move them around and 
so I, I think, you know, obviously a lot of that was learned behavior by, you know, sitting in rooms with my mom and watching directors work. Um, and so I understood what a director did at a very young age, which I think most people don't. Um, sure. But some of it, I think, is was just sort of like, I don't know. I think like innately, I think a lot in patterns and I think a lot mm -hmm. about like physicality and movement. And so like those things sort of came really naturally. Whereas like my mom, she's a theater person, but she doesn't, uh, she doesn't think physically a lot, which is mm. why she's a producer, not a director. So. Interesting. Interesting. And did, do you have a, a background in, in physical, like in dance or in any kind of physical, or is it just something you're just a visceral person? Um, I mean, I took dance as a kid, but I guess, uh, I wasn't very good at it, but um, uh, I think that what I mean more so in terms of physical is like about how you move people around in space. Mm, like yeah. my favorite part of directing is making uh, like um, uh, a chart of the stage and then drawing where all the actors are going to be because I like the puzzle of like, how do you... Um, see a big group of people in space at any given time which is why i direct a lot of musicals because when you're directing like a two-person play there are only so many options for how you arrange those two people <laughs> but when you have 30 people on stage you can really have a lot of fun with how you story tell through where people are um yeah so maybe it's more spatial than physical spatial ah, maybe. so you strike me as someone that's very organized or at least likes to make things organized i i i, I that is Guilty. <laughs> Guilty. That's you're, you're like, I, yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting because what's the distinction there? Is it that like if someone delivered something to you organized, would that be less appealing to you than if you were given something kind of messy that you got to organize? Which one would, would excite you more? Uh, I think either way. I mean, I get like, for example, when uh, someone sends an email chain that has like 10 different thoughts, but they're there are no like headers or like, it's not, it's not like, a, you know, whatever that my brain just explodes and I have to like send it back to them and like, okay, here's my like bulleted. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I do think in a very compartmentalized way. And mm. I think that I find that to be something that's pretty common for directors of large musicals, at least commercially, because when people who, who aren't directors or like aren't around directors a lot, uh, talk about directing oftentimes they'll see it as like a one-size-fits-all type of profession mm -hmm. um and to me I am not the right person to direct like a two-person classical play because my skill set is not sitting at the table and digging deep into text and like you know doing table work for two weeks my skill set is in addition to that spatial uh world is organizing people and managing people. And I think a lot of that is related to the organization and compartmentalization of how uh, I think like I, I make a lot of spreadsheets. I, I organize a lot of things because I think that what a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, for, for Broadway directors, commercial directors, like 70% of the job is sending emails, which is like, crazy when you think about it but it just is what it is and so you have to be really organized and on top of things whereas if you're a director of plays you know I, I think that probably shifts to like 40 percent of the job is sending emails. Mm. Mm. yeah it's really interesting isn't it well I often talk to people about their strengths sometimes being their weaknesses becoming weaknesses meaning that they default to them because they they work it sounds like that is a strength of yours actually Mm -hmm. yeah and what do you think's on the other side of that strength uh I would say probably a lack of patience for disorganization when things are messy I get a little overwhelmed mm -hmm. and am not the most uh, it, or it's something rather it's something I've had to work on is becoming patient when things aren't organized mm -hmm. Well, um, we could dig in there just for an hour, but I won't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's true of a lot of things. Like we, you know, everybody comes into, uh, because musical theater in particular is such a collaborative art form. We all come in with our yeah. various preferences for how things operate. And where yeah. I think teams find friction is when the preferences don't align with behaviors. Um, 
Totally. Totally. Yeah. What I discovered about you is that research is is a really important piece of yours, which makes a lot of sense to me. And actually, I would love to talk a little bit about, I watched your, um, your Broadway TEDx and mm. I love, um, there's so much I love about it. I guess I want to talk to you about your discovery of, and I'm paraphrasing, but you said something about, fa- you discovered of yourself, you discovered that facts weren't the most important thing, I think is what you mm. said. And yeah. to me, that stood out as something that was a revelation for you, mm-hmm. you know, so, like separate from the other revelations that you made through your research. Talk to me about that. When you realized that facts were not the most important thing and maybe... Tell us a little bit about what you meant and what the context was. Well, I think that it, it's um, originally when I when I became sort of obsessed with research as part of my practice, so to speak, as a director. It was more in a literal sense of like, I want to directly put this thing, this fact that I found into the show Mm. um, to make it real and like authentic. And, um, and then I think what I learned over time was that the research is actually like the, the, the bigger value of it is that if you're, if you're really grounded in what the show is actually about, um, it can, free you to dig into the drama of it and I guess what I mean by that is that like there are certainly times where I've made decisions on shows to do something that is not a hundred percent what historically happened you know for example like I directed a show set in Korea the we made the choice that the show wasn't going to be in Korean you know um but researching the uh, Korean culture and language and context allowed us to make that choice for a reason versus for convenience. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that like, similarly in the case of something like Avita, you know, I've gone to Argentina four times for research. I, I, I just, you know, think about the, his- the real historical context all the time. Um, and it's very easy to sit in rehearsal and be like, well, you know, the mistress didn't go through that door. She went through that door in the apartment. Like we know, you know, like wh- where the, we, we know history tells us so much, right. Mm-hmm. When we, when we dig into something like Evita. And I think that you have to decide as a storyteller, what are the important facts? What's like, what, what are the hierarchy of facts? Um, mm-hmm. And what is going to be more about sort of the essence and the respect for the authenticity of this story. You're speaking about truth, right? You're speaking about art and truth and where they come together, right? Yeah. So they, it's, a, it's a fictional thing that you're creating based on, and therefore you are the auteur, right? I mean, you're the... You're yeah. The, yeah, no, I get that 100%. But I think like one of the examples that I give in that, um, in that TED Talk is that, you know, uh, there's a part of Avita that depicts... Uh, voting uh yes. and uh there are some productions of Avita that depict women voting in in that particular election which is the first election of Juan Perón but um historically they were not eligible to to vote at that time and uh or they hadn't won the right to vote yet and Ava was a major part if not the reason that women ended up getting the right to vote in yeah. in Argentina and so I think that to me, that is like uh, an example of a historical fact that we must be faithful to, mm. because if we are not, it doesn't demonstrate the change that this woman affected in terms of women's rights in in this country. It sort of yeah. it sort of strips that up from her. So that's an example of where I think like we must be faithful to it. Whereas you know, she was wearing a blue dress at this event, and we put her in green. That I'm a little bit more like, okay. Yeah, fine. no, 100 percent. And and you're right. That was that was huge. That was really huge. What you pointed out with the voting thing and how you know, I mean, yeah, choreographically, it's kind of cool that you know, bing bang boom, they're all kind of doing it, boy, girl, boy, girl. 
Yeah. Lovely. But, but wow. um, yeah, no, not, because not what happened. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me think as a choreographer that man, like knowing that would inform the choreography and it would be, it would, it would enrich that scene, the voting scene, right. Where the women yeah. can't do it. I mean, yeah. my God, what you could create there um, just yeah. you know, physically would, would be yeah. amazing. Um, yeah, no, totally. But no, it was super cool. I was, I was really grateful for that, you know, to, to learn that. I mean, I think it was really cool. So thank you for that. The the other thing that really stood out um, to me was the the energetic exchange that you had with Maria Alvarez. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that and what it meant for you? Sure, of course. When I was in Argentina the second time, uh, and I was with uh, Avita's associate director, Rebecca Aparicio, and we, because of a number of uh, amazing connectors, got to meet uh, this woman named Maria Eugenia Alvarez, who was uh, Ava's nurse when she was dying of cancer um, in 1952. And this woman is uh, in her late 90s now, um, and she's living in a nursing home outside of Buenos Aires. And um, we uh, got to speak to her on that second visit, and um, it was you know, unbelievable because you're getting to, you know, this musical depicts this history that, um, you know, happened 70 years ago. Um, but to actually get to talk to someone who was there, um, it, it, it's such a rare, amazing thing. And, um, we've actually gotten to go back and visit her two more times. Um, and since then, um, and since that Ted talk and, um, she's been very generous and sort of, um, sharing her story with us on film and because we really just wanted to make sure that everything that she wanted to say was was captured yeah yeah no for sure and I love the story that you told about the um you know do you have any more questions <laughs> yeah at, at, at the very end of the our first interview with her we said you know it's time to, to to wrap up thank you so much for your time and she said oh do you have any more questions because I, I, I'm 92 years old and I might uh, die tomorrow. So ask them that, <laughs> um, which I thought was, um, she, she has a good sense of humor. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And so you stayed, it sounds like, and then you, you did have that energetic exchange that you described, right? Where you held hands. I think there's a, a beautiful photograph about that. And yeah. Yeah. Did that, I, I, it's funny. Cause I, I kind of made a note, um, that, you know, I think you said something to the effect of, uh, you know, even though I'm not a spiritual person per se, right. That, that this was a really, you know, impactful moment. And then I kind of had in my notes, I had kind of written, then she qualified it with historical. It was really funny. You said spiritual historical moment. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that <laughs> to me, I find deep meaning in history and making connections through history. I think it's less about uh, anything quote unquote spiritual. Um, but I, it. just the way I think, but I love yeah. it. I love it. It's so interesting. You're so interesting. So <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you identify with the Forbes magazines? Like with, what do they say? I know you're on that list, which is a great honor. Um, do you identify with, and I kind of looked at, you know, what that means. They call it a collection of bold risk takers, putting a new twist on old tools of the trade. Do you identify with that? Oh, I've never heard that description. That's really cool. Yeah, no, I looked up. Um, sorry, I'm a bit of a research geek myself. Huh, that's that. quite cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly a part of, I guess, what I strive to do. I think uh, a lot of the work that I got to do when I first moved to New York was site-specific. Mm. Um, and I think that site-specific musical theater is something that is like not a very common art form. Uh, just because it's really hard and requires a lot of money and resources. And, yeah. you know, I was lucky to to get to work on two site-specific musicals that I think really sort of captured people's attention and interests. And I think that that, though that's not the totality of the work that I'm, that I'm doing now, uh, did sort of speak to uh, sort of pushing at the boundaries of the art form of theater. And um, I, th I think it was what, was sort of excited the Forbes folks initially among, you know, other work that I was, that I was trying to do. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it is something that, uh, you know, I, I, 
I was a assistant and associate for the director, Rachel Chapkin, for many years. And um, she uh, said this thing to me that has really stuck with me, which is that if you're going to direct a revival of something, which is the majority of what I do, actually, mm. um, that you should uh, always try to say something that hasn't been said before about that piece which is not to sort of negate the work that is that has come before you have to honor and 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 respect and build on that work it is rather to say if you're just gonna sort of replicate or do a slightly different version of what's come before you might as well do the original version because in most cases pieces survive because the original was great so that's something that I think about a lot with like a piece like Avita, where you know the the, the original production is is such a north star for me mm. um and if I wasn't going to say something new, I would just ask, could I be the person to sort of replicate, you know, that that production? Um, but I did have an idea for saying something new. And that sort of led to, you know, what, what we ultimately did. Yeah, totally. Hence the honor and the integrity, you know, that that I mentioned that you lead with. It sounds like, again, that that's really important to you to, you know, not for the sake of doing you know, pushing yeah. boundaries, but rather to, for the sake of you being as effective as you can be and using your gifts to elevate and impact. Yeah. I exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I see that in you. It's beautiful. So what's your definition of living in the moment? <laughs> uh, oh, these questions are deep. I don't know that I have one. I guess it's just something that I'm trying to do uh, more of because I think that the life of a director is necessarily aimed at planning things that are happening in the future. Uh, it's not a very, you know, it's not, it's not a job that allows you to, to, to be that focused only on the here and now. And so uh, it's also something that I think a lot about in terms of um, the distinction between time as a director of when you're in a room versus when you're doing something else because in order to make a living in this industry, you have to be working on five, six, seven plus projects at a given time, uh, which doesn't mean that you're in rehearsal for them at a given time, but that you are, that you are, you do have a lot of like, you know, plate spinning. And I think that um, when I'm in rehearsal on one project, I'll often catch myself, even when I'm, you know, literally speaking to an actor, mm. thinking about what I have to, the email I have to send on the break about another project. And it's distracting. Um, and so I have to sort of uh, train myself to uh, focus better. Um, and so that's something. Yeah, no, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. That's not easy to share. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it, sh it says a lot about you because you've got an awareness of it, which is huge. And you don't have to, but it sounds like you'd like to sort of, there's an awareness that, uh, you know, that there might be another way that, that, that might serve me better. Right. And I'm curious yeah. to know. Yeah. So why do you think that is like, what's, is that an intuitive hit? Is that an intellectual thing? Is it like an, an analysis of that's not ideal or is it is sort of a feeling that, ah, oh, this is maybe not the way I want to show up or what's going on there? I, I honestly think it's comparative actually, because mm. when I think about when, when I was in college and I was really working on one production at a time, I remember the feeling of being so obsessed with every detail of it that it allowed me to um, sort of anticipate problems better. It allowed me to um, really understand what the other people that I was working with were feeling in a given moment. Um, whereas when you're working on a lot of different things, you can only go so deep with your obsession, which is a blessing and a curse of a busy career. But, um, you know, I, I, I do miss the days where I was like a hundred percent obsessed with something and had no distraction to that obsession. Um, and I think that it's the sort of thing where if you look back at, you know, the way Hal Prince directed musicals, he only worked on one at a time for the mm. most part. Um, and, uh, there's really something to be said for that, that I don't think is replicable in our present moment, strictly from a financial perspective. Um, you know, if, 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 if someone you know, because the timeline of musicals is so different than it used to be. Like it used to be that 
from start, you know, pen to paper to first opening on Broadway, it could be a year and a half. Yeah. Um, you know, now we talk about eight years. So you have to do something else while you're waiting for the writers to, you know, write the next draft or whatever, you know, so it, it's, it's a, it's a journey. Yeah. Super, super interesting. What's the hardest thing you've ever done? Uh, <laughs> well, my, my immediate answer is a, a bit of a dark one. Um, my, my, uh, fiance was taken hostage by the Taliban, <gasps> um, and we had to get him out. Um, so, uh, that was really hard. Um, I mean, at, get, both the getting him out and the dealing with that. Um, so yeah, no kidding. I, I have a, I have a quick answer. <laughs> wow. Wow. What's the yeah. easiest thing you've ever done? Um, I don't know. I feel like every, like, you know, every day you do easy things, right? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I love it. That, that, that's, that's, that's a harder question than what's the hardest thing you've ever done because I feel like, you know, brushing my teeth in the morning is easy. Yeah. Well, it, it is funny because often we don't think about, like when things are going well, we don't often stop to think about them going well until they're not going well. And then we sure. go, shit, it was going really well. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, let me ask you this. What's the easiest decision you've ever made? Does that clarify? Does that help? Uh, yes, but I feel like my answer would sort of be the same. Okay. Like there, there are easy like I relish in easy decisions as someone has to have to make tons of decisions every day. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. in a given year, I think about this a lot, like this year, uh, I've been part of the hiring process of probably 300 people. Mm -hmm. Um, and those decisions are, uh, huge because yeah. you're affecting someone's entire life, you know, um, uh, yeah. not to, like self-aggrandized, but, no, but no, no. you know, it, 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 employment is a, a really important thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's that sort of Steve Jobs thing of uh, the reason he wore the same outfit every day was to reduce the number of decisions he had to make in a given day. So yep. I, I love the easy decisions of like, all right, am I going to wear this sweater or this sweater? Easy. Um, uh, it's the hard the, the decisions that have a lot of weight that yeah. really take me a lot of time. Yeah, no, 100%. What's um, what's one big audacious goal that maybe you haven't put out in the universe yet that you might have? Is there anything kind of mingling in there right now? Hmm. Uh, well, this isn't something I haven't necessarily like said before, but I haven't really like taken a lot of action to, to, to make it so, but I, I really want to move more into, um, directing big ceremonies. Uh, it's something I'm really excited about, like, um, the Olympic opening ceremonies or like the Paralympic opening ceremonies, things like that. Um, and I think oftentimes when you're in a certain art form, you get on the train of being in that art form and you just, you know, do step after step after step of what you think you're supposed to do versus saying, actually, I'm, there's something over there that's really interesting and, yeah. you know, uh, figuring out how to sort of satisfy both interests. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You'd be so amazing at that too. Right. Especially with your love of the shampoo bottles. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> like managing I mean, it's, it's all the, those. Oh, you'd be in heaven. The grandeur of it. Yeah. You'd be in heaven. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Did you enjoy like the, the whole Royal, all, all the ceremony and pomp that, yeah, I bet you would. Yeah. I love that stuff. It's really yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. No, I I'm with you on that. That's amazing. Um, what do you know will stay true about you no matter what happens? Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, I think probably work ethic. Um, I work really, really hard. Um, I work really long hours and I enjoy it and, uh, I get a lot of joy from my work. And, uh, if I go a whole day without like sending an email, I, you know, uh, have, uh, <laughs> a, a, a small breakdown. Um, so, um, uh, I, I just can't, even if, even if, you know, 10 years from now, 
I go to a completely different industry, which, you know, could happen. Um, I think the desire to work hard is something that would never go away. Yeah, I believe you. Do you, how does play show up for you in your life? Uh, I am getting better at that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, uh, in the sense that like, I think, uh, I wasn't focused on anything that was, uh, quote unquote for the purpose of fun, uh, for many, many years. Um, and I think, uh, part of that for me is about like having a partner, um, and, uh, like, when you're constantly with another human, like finding things that are fun is easier uh, because you have someone to sort of like drag you away from the work um, in in, in a good way. Um, uh, Yeah. But I feel like to some extent, like our art form is quite fun. So um, I find a lot of like quote unquote play in that. Yeah. No, fair enough. Congratulations, by the way. So when's the wedding date? uh next summer cool that's exciting yeah yeah um oh this is a tricky one let's see where you go with this and (laughs) what do you what do you not want people to know about you (laughs) oh gosh uh (laughs) well that's like a mind trick of a question um uh because then you have to say it um you don't have to uh, say it no no um uh, well, I'll, I'll say for, for many years, I didn't want people to know my age. Um, oh. yeah. And now I'm very chill about it. Um, and in fact, like, I think it's something that's helped me, um, more than anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think there is a, there's a belief that, um, you know, uh, there's a lack of trust in young people in this industry, which I have having just been one and like still kind of being one, I actually don't think is necessarily as bad as when as young getsy people like to think it is because to me, I I interpret that more so as uh, we, something like directing a big $14 million musical is really hard. And it's not something that we should graduate college and then be handed the keys to without demonstrating that we have the skill set to uh, handle it. Um, and of course, like, you know, privilege plays into that conversation and who's getting the opportunities and and all of that. But I do think that like there, and I was one of them, there are a lot of like indignant young people saying, um, you know, we, uh, we're not allowed to do these things when we're young. And I think that like, that's actually an issue with like access and pay structures for assistants and associates, not so much the fact that we're not handing uh, heads of department jobs to people with no experience. So, um, uh, so I think that it's like a, the issue is sort of more nuanced. Um, And I think when I was 22, I was like, nobody will let me direct a Broadway musical today. Um, And it's like, well, yeah. (laughs) Correct. (laughs) <laughs> go 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 learn some things and then you know um uh so i i but now i mean to bring it back to the question i think that like i sort of as a result of that saw age as a bit of a weakness i was like if people think i'm older then they'll let me do these jobs um but like look at me i don't look old um uh <laughs> unfortunately um uh so um uh, you know, I, I remember like talking with other sort of young friends and being like, should we wear glasses? Will that make us look older? Should we, should we wear blazers? Will that make us look older? Um, and now I think I actually get certain jobs because I'm young and people want a sort of young take on things uh, for whatever whatever yeah um, no that's interesting yeah. too it's funny though right the optics like and actually believing that the optics really are the thing like oh if they yeah. think i'm older there but that's not you know it, your experience is still your experience exactly exactly <laughs> the same thing works for older people right i mean that what about the older people that want to enter the industry who have a shitload of experience maybe in other areas that would be brilliant doing it you're not going to give it to them either until 
you know, they know how to do all the other stuff. I mean, there are skills, there are just skills that you need to learn, right? Right. Which I think is about, like, highlights the issue with access for uh, positions in which you can learn. Yes. Um, yes. And, and like, that's, to me, that's the issue. Not mm. so much that we're not saying uh, y- you who just graduated college come direct this Broadway musical. It's more so that like I, as a white woman with parents in the industry was able to become a Broadway associate director when I was 22 years old. So I learned as an assistant, as, so- as an associate, how to be a director. And thus now I'm becoming a Broadway director, but that the access to that, that job is what gave me the skills to be able to have the job I now have, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. You're a lifelong apprenticeship, basically. Yeah. 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 And yes, you're acknowledging that, you know, you were lucky that that happened. You know, it doesn't happen for everybody. Okay. But but if it's, if it, it can, there's no reason why that can't be offered, right? It sounds like you, you probably are going to look for opportunities to elevate that. I think I saw you doing something or at least involved with, or maybe you just shared something going on with writers in the Ukraine. There was something that I saw on your Insta, which it, right, oh, yeah. which kind of fits into that sort of, yes, like let's, let's, you know, give these guys at least some opportunities to, to start playing in the field. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, instead of waiting um, on the sidelines, because there's that other side, which is that when you're ready and then it's very binary. Right. And I think we're talking about yeah. that beautiful place in between where between here and here is this incredible place where, you know, where it suddenly it becomes a synthesis of learning, of connecting, of collaborating and seg- it's a segue as opposed right. to. Yeah, no, for sure. I'm like all about those kinds of in-between places, right? Where that's yeah. a possibility. Yeah, that's super cool. So um, how do you want to be remembered? Oh, um, uh, that's a little light question. Well, I mean, I'm 29, so hopefully I have a lot more time before. uh I have to think in that way, but I uh, want to have made an impact in some way, whatever that means. Yeah, um, no, for sure. So it's funny that you say, you know, I'm I'm young now, so you know, I haven't really thought about it, and it's really funny because this is exactly when, if you think about it, then when you get up in the morning and you remember that you can step like you are doing, you're already doing it, but, you know, making impact every day, if that's your thing, right? Do you know what I mean? It Because it's between yeah. now and then, as opposed to looking back and hoping that I've made an impact, yeah. just make it today. That's what, you know, just do it, right? I mean, that's, yeah, that's super yeah. cool though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get that. Can you finish this phrase? Most people think Sammy is, but the truth is. Oh. I would say um, this is a slightly like creative answer, but um, Mm -hmm. I think as a director, part of your job is making sure that any given project that you're working on has the sense that that is that that project and their work are at the center of your universe and uh, you're prioritizing them. Uh, it's sort of like if you have like eight children, you're supposed to like make each child feel like they're the favorite. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I obviously my collaborators know that I'm working on other projects, but I think that one of the things that I strive to do every day is create the sentiment that your focus is singular, um, yeah. even though it obviously can't be. Yeah, I love that. So, yeah. So li- living into sort of, creating ease for them to understand that yeah even though you realize that it's going to be received in a way from their point of view right that oh it's it's all us and and that's normal like like you said like a child but that you know that's yeah. not the full truth because obviously you're you're not superhuman but to yeah. really be actually you're kind of speaking about to be as in the moment as you can with each of your children i mean it is kind of what you're talking about isn't yeah. it yeah yeah so it's we're going to do a rapid fire it doesn't have to be rapid but do you do you like the idea of a rapid fire, or uh, sure? Okay, let's yeah, just totally. let's, let's just do it. And if you don't want to do it rapid, no one ever really does. Okay. <laughs> but if you want to play, then we'll do it. So I'm just going to say a word, and I'm going to say what makes you, and I'm going to say a word, and you're going to just say whatever comes to your mind, and we'll just go from okay. there. Yeah, sound good. So what makes you hungry? Uh, seeing food. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you sad? 
Afghanistan. I'm very close to that country. And so I spend a lot of time being sad about that. Yeah. What inspires you? Movies. What frustrates you? Laziness. Laziness, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Your own or others? Both. Ah. (laughs) Um, What makes you laugh? A lot. I like to be a happy laughing person. (laughs) What makes you angry? Laziness. (laughs) Yeah, fair enough. And finally, what makes you grateful? Um, probably my partner most of all. Hmm. What are the top three things that have happened so far today? Oh, I went for a walk. Hmm. Um, and I got my inbox to four, which is pretty good. And I'm in Nebraska, so it's an hour earlier, so not much has happened today. <laughs> um, uh, I, I sent some difficult emails that were sort of weighing on me, so that was good. Oh, good to get them go. Yeah. What are you doing in Nebraska? Uh, my fiance's family lives out here, and so oh. we spend a lot of time here during the summer, and um, it's very peaceful and quiet, so I, I work away from here. And Oh, lovely. So what's something that you're you're looking forward to later today? And then what is something that you're looking forward to in the future? Uh, later today, uh, we are going to visit a potential venue for our wedding, which will be nice. Fun. That's exciting. Um, and then in the future, uh, I'm taking one of those... Um, this is a very specific random thing, but it was just the first thing that came to mind. Yeah. I'm taking one of those um, Amtrak, uh, like a partial cross country uh, trains. Um, Cause I have to go to a friend's wedding in um, Seattle. Uh-huh. So we're going to take a train from Omaha to Sacramento and then Sacramento to Seattle. Wonderful. Fun. Yeah. That so. will be fun. Yeah. Amazing. I love that you have the time to do that. I mean, uh, I, I'm going to be working on the train, but, um, uh, but, Good for but you. yeah, yeah, Good for you. Uh, it's a crazy year, but, um, yeah. I, uh, much of, much of what's crazy about it, I can handle as long as I have Wi-Fi. So yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. And there's nothing like being on a train working actually. Exactly. It's very productive. I, it really, really is. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for Likewise. joining. Likewise. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I've been speaking today with Sammy Canold. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. And remember to live in the moment. (laughs) In music, stop time is that beautiful moment where the band is suspended in rhythmic unison, supporting the soloist to express their individuality. In the moment, I encourage you to take that time and create your own rhythm. Until next time, I'm Lisa Hopkins. Thanks for listening.